Hi, everybody, and welcome to Funside Barbell, our first episode. Uh, my name is Dan, and this is my co-host, Reese. Hello. And we're going to be talking about powerlifting, strength training, nutrition, supplements, and meathead shit in general. Uh, we're going to be um, hopefully sharing some of our experience, and uh, we're going to be very open to questions, so please uh, contact us at funsidebarbell at gmail.com. We, we'd love to hear from you, and... Uh, any sorts of questions you guys might have about training and nutrition and so on. Um, yeah, pretty much what we're trying to do is pretty much do a QA and a uh, without all of the extra hype as to who we are, uh, you know, and just focusing on what we're doing. Uh, we, we want something easier for, like, the beginner to understand. So we decided there's a lot of podcasts out there, and we could repackage – already you know developed systems but that's already been done so it's more like what do you need to know in order to start powerlifting the uh, like what got you what got you interested in powerlifting you know we'll talk about that with ourselves like when did we start working out when did we start lifting weights all that fun stuff um so more importantly this first podcast is just like a meet and greet and uh we'll touch base a little bit near the end on What's a good way to start going about starting in the world of powerlifting? And each episode, we'll try to take it a little further so that hopefully you can develop a system that works for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, really, since this is our first episode, we were going to start with a, a really common question. Um, is what got you into strength training? Uh, what got you into lifting weights and led you into uh into the sport of powerlifting. Uh, Reese, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, I got into lifting weights when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, I started taking my dad's 10-pound uh, dumbbells and uh, keeping them in my room. So it got to the point where he had to keep retrieving them so many times that he ended up buying me my own set of weights. And then the bug hit me, and every time we'd go to the mall, we'd go to Champ Sporting Goods, and I'd end up getting, like, another accessory to the weights, a uh, nice chrome set with spin dial attachments, and then I got uh, an easy curl bar and then a hammer curl bar. I had every curl bar imaginable. I even <laughs> had an attachment for a cable machine because I thought it was another curl bar, and I had no idea <laughs> that you had to hook it up to a cable machine. Um I got it to help me with, uh, I, I was really heavy into karate, and the I figured, like, you know, if I get bigger muscles, I'll be faster and stronger, and they uh, figured it would help me with that, and then you look into bodybuilding, and then uh, you hit a, uh, after I outgrew my home set, uh, I joined a gym upstate New York, Summit Hill Athletic Club, and, you know, started just following what everybody else did in the gym, and uh, from there, uh, I started to realize that I liked tracking my numbers more than tracking how I looked, and that developed into trying to become stronger, not necessarily powerlifting, you know, being squat, bench, and deadlift, but just being stronger in all the lifts in general. Uh, then I got interested in strongman uh, and uh you know, started uh, mimicking those uh, exercises I saw on the World's Strongest Man, and uh, poorly, my, I might add. Like, just had no carpentry skills to build anything that I saw on World's Strongest Man, but I tried. Um, you didn't have the jumbo jet with a harness? That was the only thing I did have. <laughs> everything else was, was just terrible. I mean, uh, the, um, I mean, I tried everything. I'd fill up really big, heavy grain bags so I could carry them, and uh, lived on a ranch, so like I did have access to heavy equipment, but um, you know, throwing hay bales for height over the trailers, like you know, just all kinds of silly stuff that really got me nowhere. Um, I'll have a little bit more to touch on, but Dan, what got you into lifting? So uh, it started for me when I was 15 as a uh, as a pretty pretty much a skinny fat uh, 150 pound. A freshman in high school and everyone was going out for football and in sort of that first off season you go through a program that the coaches uh, explain everything and they they teach you basics and 
So really from that first winter where they would teach you the basics of lifting weights, a you know, very basic program, but that was sort of all of our introduction is going in with teammates and you know, other other kids that you're friends with. It wasn't a commercial gym. It's pretty much all uh, high school students surrounded with coaches telling you what to do. And we went through that through the first year, and I just absolutely got bit by the bug in that first year. And when I started seeing myself uh, gaining weight and making some really positive changes and uh, being able to consistently move up in, uh, in all the, the main lifts, I said, wow, this is fun for its own sake. So while doing that, I started um, looking at bodybuilding magazines and reading about bodybuilding and, and all that. And I'm sure what a lot of people did is uh, trying to copy and paste uh, a pro bodybuilder's routine when you're uh, starting off, which I think a lot of us realize doesn't work that well, but it's a mistake pretty much everyone makes at one time or another when they're starting out. And what was really great for us was that even though this program was run by high school football coaches who were pretty much uh, teachers who would volunteer, we did get a really good strength and conditioning coach who um, was very well educated and taught us all the Olympic lifts. He taught us conditioning principles, technique principles, uh, rehab principles, all sorts of things and all about translating you know, performance in the off season into getting bigger and stronger and delivering better on the field. And um, so the, my time in high school was just really built around football and lifting. Now, when was your high school time period? What, what years were this? This was from 2001 to 2005. Wow. Yeah, I was in high school uh, in the mid-90s, and we didn't have any of that. We had a very small closet with a universal Nautilus equipment that had like a, like a bench press station, a leg extension, leg curl station, some type of leg press station, and a shoulder press station. And we were pretty much just sent in there to figure it out. Like we were all just hurting ourselves because God forbid you pick up less than what the next guy did. And, uh, they had some hex, uh, hex head, uh, dumbbells, but like, I mean, they went up to 40 pounds and that was like the Mecca. Like if you can hold on to that 40 pound dumbbell and do a curl, now you're God. Um, yeah. but it was, we had no clue what we were doing. So, I mean, just even in a 10 year difference, five to 10 year difference, just how much different knowledge is out there. Um, so, you know, and a lot of that will play in, like hopefully for you younger lifters and everything, you did get some type of education or, or foundation in high school, at least in gym. And if not gym through your coaches, uh, cause I mean, it was that information was not out there and there was no real internet yet. So it, it wasn't even a thing in the mid nineties to go online and cut and paste. Me cutting and pasting is going to uh, the gas station and grabbing whatever muscle magazine is on the shelf that month and trying to copy what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And even even now things have gotten different or I mean every place is different, but I've seen in in uh, my old high school the part of health class involves taking uh, students to the gym and I think that's such a great thing, especially for females. And this is that's a whole subject we can talk about in a later podcast is really the benefits of uh, strength training for women. But to get the stigma away from it and get them in the, in the gym and say, you know, you don't just have to run on a treadmill for an hour. There's other things you can do that might be a lot more rewarding and a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, the... It, the, I mean, we could talk about females for hours, and it doesn't have to just be about the gym. But, um, yeah. I mean, you know, the, it's with YouTube, with just every other website that's out there, there's so much information that you can get lost. Um, what I see trending now is a lot of new lifters following one or two YouTube channels and getting all their information from that, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. But I also see a lot of 
not misguided information, but it's almost like this is what we're doing. This is the only way to do it. Um, or just that guy's in particular training method. And it tends to lead to uh, modeling yourself after maybe a body type that isn't like yours, which is a whole hour discussion in itself on just body ergonomics. Um, biochemistry, uh, biochemistry, uh, biochemistry is yet another day. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> just, just, just how you are going to respond to that same type of work could be different. And that's what we want to talk about. Um, so that's why I can't wait for the next podcast when we actually have questions to work off of. Um, so, you know, ultimately, like, Dan, what did, what did you find to be the turning point where you went from football into wanting to powerlift? I think when I, I went to college and went out for the team and found that, wow, I am not going to make it in football. Um, and just how you need to have uh, certain skills and certain combinations of speed and strength and size that, uh, I, I mean, I played at a Division three school, uh, which is not anywhere near the highest level of competition. And it was, uh, a lot of it was trying to keep my head above water. But when the off season came, I still always enjoyed the training aspect. And towards the end of playing football, I said, well, you know, I really want to compete in powerlifting because I think even if even if the numbers aren't potentially, you know, anything to m make people blow people's minds, I want to get good at this. And I really enjoyed the process. And now it's uh, it's my sport. I think it's a really appealing sport to a lot of people because it caters to different body types. It's a weight class sport. If you go to a meet, you see a lot of different types of people. You see, you know, tall people with long arms who can lever up their deadlifts. You see people with barrel chests who can really take command in the bench press. And I think that's just this innate balance that the sport has. And, you know, pushing your limits is just really appealing to me. And I'll throw it back at you, Reese. What, uh, what led from these roots to competing in powerlifting? The, uh, well, I was, uh, I was working uh, as a student trainer uh, for a police academy upstate while at college, and I was pretty much just in charge of the weight room and running the cadets uh, out uh, around uh, uh, a set track that they had, and it was really nothing. It was no real training aspect on my part, but um. I saw that that uh, that training was something I wanted to get into, and I had and um, I put that on hold uh, for a little bit and just focused on training myself because that was my first thing was just becoming better. I felt I wasn't really good at lifting weights in general. I would always feel um, like when I was curling, even just a bar for biceps, that one side of my body was stronger and I just wanted more symmetry with my movements. And, um, I always had a really weak grip. And then I found out that I don't have a weak grip. I just have really small hands and that my grip has to be twice as strong. So I would always try to overdo everything to become stronger in general, but I didn't have any real gauge and, then I kind of stumbled into deadlifting, didn't even think about bench pressing for one rep. Like that, that just wasn't done at the bodybuilder gyms upstate New York. Like powerlifting was just an unknown thing. I, I, I what I thought was powerlifting was Olympic lifting. I, I had no idea what the difference was. The, uh, nor did I even really care. It was just, um, everybody at the gym did deadlift. That seemed to be the big deal. And working on a ranch, tossing hay bales, uh, you know, constantly lifting with your legs. Turns out I was gifted at deadlifting without ever deadlifting. And at weighing a buck fifty, I could deadlift in the four hundreds. And like everybody was like, "Whoa!" And and like that got me really excited. That like, oh, I could be good at this. And um, that slowly trickled into the three big lifts, but it took longer for me than I think it did other people. Like I, I didn't look at it as a sport. I just looked at it as a gauge of my overall strength. And, um, 
the uh, then I uh, went to school in the city um, and started hitting local uh, local tournaments, local meets, uh, but they weren't really um, as sanctioned as they could be. They were always sponsored by either Metarex, MHP, um, or multiple sponsors, and they were more like like um, exhibitions. And um, I then found that I enjoyed training the other people that were competing that also went to the same gyms that I went to. And, I mean, we really didn't know anything. Like, I didn't even have any certifications at the time. I didn't know anything. And um, it was just I happened to read more magazines than the other guy and also tried different stuff that I found worked for me and then started dishing that out. And um, from there, I then started getting real certifications and I started visiting places uh, that we'll get into in other podcasts. And my knowledge really grew. And I wish I knew now, knew, knew, knew then what I know now, yeah. the, um, because I would have been a lot, I would have had a lot less injuries and I probably would have had um, a genuine career in powerlifting. Um, my choices would have been dramatically different. And uh, maybe I wouldn't have two obliterated discs, a uh, uh, torn uh, bicep in my right arm, torn shoulder in my right arm, a uh, blown capsule in my left elbow, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the trademark torn meniscus, uh, papilloteal tendon ripped out of my left leg, uh, you know, shattered ankles, like those things wouldn't have existed maybe. Uh, maybe I wouldn't need... Uh, ibuprofen every time it rains um but you know but you know they uh but it is what it is um going into it now um i'm a little older a little wiser and i just want to pass on some of that and uh that's it for me yeah it really it really is a a, a mick foley-esque list of of injuries uh that, that you've had to deal with and and i think there's a feeling among beginners is how do I avoid injuries and I always look at it as a, a probability type thing in a long enough time frame everyone's going to deal with something if you're pushing yourself I mean if you're constantly doing workouts and over 10 years and never have one small thing I I might contend you're not training that hard you know and that there is a very blurry line between pushing yourself and you know pushing past those limits and but something experienced lifters have is they have a better idea of where that line is and what they're capable of and they sort of know you can you can live to fight another day sometimes when it comes to dealing with those things and um, really I think that leads into our next topic of tips advice that you would give to a beginner give to yourself if you were starting, uh, if you're going back and you could start over again for, for me, I would say one of the number one things is having clearly defined goals because the, today there's so much information, you know, initially I said, I want to be as strong as possible. So I would go and read about, read about West side barbell, read about lead FTS, read about powerlifting training and see, okay, what do elite powerlifters do? and try to apply that. But in retrospect, that was not appropriate training for someone at my level because that those advanced training techniques are certainly effective, but they might not be optimal for someone who's still building their base and still developing that initial muscle, that initial strength, which uh, for many people takes years yeah. to, to develop. So just having those defined goals and not losing sight of it, like, a lot of people say, I'm too fat, I got to cut weight. So they start cutting down, and then you look around, you look to your left, to the right, and say, man, that guy looks pretty big, man, I, I, should, I should bulk up. So you start bulking up, and then three weeks in, you're saying, ah, I'm fat again. And a lot of people do this, and they hop from diet to diet, from program to program, constantly chasing things out. Now, you know, it's it's really not one rep max that matters so much, really it's conditioning that matters, and and they'll have these revelations, chase something for a few months, give up on it, chase something else. And this, keep, this keeps people spinning their wheels 
for years and years. And that's why a lot of people you see at the gym who probably train pretty damn hard, they look the same every year you go to the gym. Yeah, and the uh, that definitely that definitely is cross the board exactly what happens with any type of training. Um, like, and when we say like build your base, like, do you even know what that means? Like, I mean, we're <laughs> we're I keep stopping myself while I'm talking because I want to edit what I'm thinking because I want to keep it simple. Um, there, there's. Uh, it seems every podcast, every YouTube video, the people after they give their credentials, they just start slamming you with science. And don't get me wrong, I mean, like uh, I'm very well read, and Dan is a scientist. <laughs> we're trying, we're not trying to keep it stupid. We're just trying to keep it simple, because yeah. like I didn't know what all these big words are, but then you end up going off on different tangents of, um, of research just to understand what the guys in the videos are talking about because you want to be them. So first define what it is. I've, I'm, I've been, I'm 37 years old and I'm still trying to define who I am. The, uh, there's, you know, what is your goal? Like the, uh, you know, is it to compete? Is it just to look better? Uh, you can power lift and look better. Like, like it doesn't mean you have to have a chiseled frame or you have to be this lumbering, bulking mass. Like, are you just, is this the route you want to take for fitness? Do, do you want to compete in five weeks, five months, five years? Never. Um, you know, maybe see where it goes. And if you, like, cause, like no one's created equal. And, yeah. and I think everyone is under the pretense that we are. And then they have shattered dreams when they figure out that they're not good at a sport. Um, the uh, you know I'm I'm afraid of quoting legends in powerlifting, but I mean Louis Simmons from West Side Barbell. I mean he's five foot nothing, and he's said it a million times. Like you know he's not meant to play in the NBA. Like that that that's because <laughs> you're you know you're not going to do well. Like you have to be, you know, if you want to be in the you know the top. Five percent. You have to be built for it. I'm personally not built for powerlifting, other than having really strong lower back and and uh, and glutes and hamstrings. Like the rest of me, I'm I'm kind of built like a kangaroo. I mean, the uh, you know, and kangaroos can't bench. So, you know, de define what it is to you. What what do you look to get out of this? I personally just like seeing my progress on paper. Uh, I was never very aesthetic. Uh, I, ha uh, I eat well, probably too well, and uh, I deal with a lot of health issues that don't allow me to drop uh, body weight relatively easy. Uh, I'm more endomorphic in my frame, and uh, weight loss has always been a challenge to me. But if I can look on a piece of paper and see, you know, week one that my bench is, you know, 225 and – you, you know, week 40, you know, I jumped to 300, like, that's a major win, you know, um, the uh, just random numbers that yeah. doesn't happen like that. But, yeah, like, really, there's nothing like making progress, Cause whether, no matter what program you're doing, if you are seeing tangible progress, and this is something Ed Cohn talked about in an interview, he just says, if, it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. If you're racing up, especially beginners who who begin, usually, if they're working hard and they're on any sort of program, they'll add 5, 10 pounds a week in all the major lifts, and they'll do this for some time. Then you reach a point where that stops, and then you have to start examining your training, and that's I think that's when you start leaving that beginner stage behind. Not to put too hard a label on anything, but in my opinion, that's when you sort of stop being a beginner, is when you've maxed out those, uh, those newbie gains, and now you, you have to start exploring more yeah and the and the uh that's when the injuries start coming because you want that same success week in week out so you keep adding weight and i i know i've missed lifts and then would go back thinking that it was just my grip wrap up with some wrist straps try to pull a weight again and then all of a sudden i'm busting up a muscle in my hamstring or my lower back or pulling my shoulder out of the socket just because I saw in a magazine another guy at about the same weight class do that. And, you know, you, you have to be real with yourself. 
Um, so if if I had to give the first piece of advice to getting into powerlifting is get prepared to do it. Um, you know, body build, like learn learn how your body functions with different payloads. You know, do biceps, do triceps, do shoulder work, do forearm work, do quads, hamstrings. Work every muscle in your body. You know, learn what all the machines in the gym are. The uh, like, I'm I'm so surprised when I walk into a gym and like you see people who, for the definition of powerlifting, just squat, deadlift, and bench, but never use the machines. Nor do they even know how to adjust the seat on them. Like. Know the equipment in your gym and know your body and how it responds to it. So give yourself a few months. You know, you can't go from, you know, playing Xbox week one to, you know, deadlift, deadlifting world records, you know, week 20. Like, you know, get, get a physical prowess about yourself. The, uh, like, you know, it's just like anything. If you go to a karate class, um, you know, or you go for swimming lessons, like, you're not immediately doing knockdown tournaments or jumping off the high board. Like you have to get your feet wet. You have to learn the moves of the sport. So, you know, and you need to know how to move your body in more than, you know, two planes. Yeah. And I think the the subject of machines and not being able to, to identify them, I think is so relevant today because for a while, when in more in the 90s when, I think bodybuilding had more attention and, and powerlifting was less well known. A lot of people use machines for all sorts of things in the gym. And there was sort of a renaissance of teaching beginners barbell lifts, which is great. I know Mark Ripito is a big proponent of this. And at the end of the day, that's great because they are the most effective, biggest lifts. But it doesn't mean that, you know, a meal shouldn't just be the main course. There's other things that help. And, you know, people are, are happy to take all sorts of supplements. Well, machines are supplemental to training. And, you know, no machine is perfect. You know, a, a Smith machine doesn't give you what a regular barbell squat gives you. But smart trainers know how to use machines to suit their needs, to target their things. You know, so... Let's not demonize all machines. You know, for building a base for a young, healthy athlete, sure, start with barbell lifts. But for people who are starting at ground zero with no prior athletic experience, it's a very different world. You know, someone who comes out of an athletic background, they might not know how to lift weights, but if they have experience in, you know, contact sports or uh, any endurance sport at a high school or collegiate level, they're going to have a, a very different athletic background. When the Russians train their athletes for the Olympics, it's a lifetime endeavor. They look at their at their athletes in multi-year training plans. They don't they don't just take anyone off the street to enter these programs. And I think whenever you see an an athlete at a whether it's at a professional level or someone who's just been training for a long time, really they bear a history of all this, all these different types of training. You know, uh, there's massive bodybuilders who start off as soccer players and they transitioned that, you know, and just carried that work capacity, that discipline, that training. And it's the same for anything. Yeah. So, so after you establish what well, who you are going into this, and that's going to change. But just pick somewhere to start from. The uh, you know I'm you know I'm John Smith, and my deadlift is 135, and I would like that to be more in a year. Okay, like that's the goal. The uh, you have to learn the movements. Uh, you know the, this is all audio. There's no way we're going to be able to show you a deadlift movement. Yeah, we could talk about it till we're blue in the face, but you could tell us how you did that deadlift till you're blue in the face. It's going to be interpreted different when we see it, uh, or if you see us do it. The so uh, I hate when uh, when a client will come to me and and tell me that their deadlift form is awesome and they've just been stuck at 350 for the last six months. 
And then when you look at it, you realize they're doing nothing more than a Romanian deadlift. Like they're all lower back. They, uh, there, there's, they, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing there. There's no real technique. So, you know, learn your lifts. Uh, you know, YouTube is perfect for that. There's a million people on there giving out good information on technique. Um, I mean, I found that as my body structure has changed over the years, my technique has changed. And that's a major thing for people starting out. Tall, lankier people in the deadlift, it looks very different for them. And But it doesn't mean they can't be excellent at it. Brian Shaw is an excellent deadlifter, and he's something like six foot nine. There's all sorts of different body types. And, and that's the thing is that not, not to make such an authoritative point, but this notion of absolute perfect form doesn't really exist. There's definitely some things you should and shouldn't do in the major lifts, but there isn't a perfect form that's going to be perfect for everybody just because everyone has different mechanics. And you, this doesn't seem like such a radical point, but there's people preaching all sorts of things about what to do with your back, what to do with your knees in certain lifts, and it might, it very well may not apply to you. But these are things that they can't really be told. They can't really be taught indirectly. You sort of have to figure them out for yourself. And that's where the fun is. That's where I find the fun in it. The, you know, um, the older I get, the more injuries I accrue, uh, the more health issues I have are just other obstacles that play into my programming for myself. And the, uh, you know, you got to, and that's where I find the fun in it. I track everything that I do. I've been doing, I've been logging everything that I've ever done in the gym since I was 16 years old. And I enjoy logging it. And I, I look back and I don't sit there and reminisce, but it's like, oh yeah, this worked for me here. This stopped working for me here. Oh yeah, that's why. And you see all that. And that's the fun in it for me. You know, maybe logging data isn't fun for you. I mean, logging the rest of my life is terrible. I've never balanced my checkbook in my life. But, like, I, you know, I, I enjoy sitting there, especially now in front of the computer in a Word doc, just plugging in my information and seeing what I did six weeks ago and trying to beat that. Uh, you know, and uh, because our workouts are always changing, and we'll get into that more in the next, uh, the, the next episode. But, you know, Find out what you're going to enjoy out of doing this because it can't just be picking up more weight because there's going to be a time when that when you stop picking up more weight and the, the, the training gets frustrating. Like everybody loves rewards. Like otherwise they wouldn't go to Atlantic City and play the slot machines. Like you want you, you want to win, but you're not always going to win by getting a new number. You could win by – um, improving your form, uh, improving some other little aspect of the training. It might not always be that big number that you're that you're shooting for. Um, you know, maybe it's hitting an old number better. Yeah. Because a max is going to be sloppy. It's if it's perfect, looking to you, it's probably not your max. But you can't really test your max every single time because then you're going to get injured. And and again, we're, we're really stepping over ourselves when we're talking because there is so much information we want to get out there, but we want to keep it simple. And, uh, you know, you know, and that's where we want to go with this. Uh, we're going to have people on the, on our show that, uh, work with us. Um, some will be clients that I have that are at different stages of their lifting career from complete novice to where they think they're ultra experienced, but they're only six months deep. Um, because with every YouTube video they watch, they become wiser and they, 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 they feel they're ahead of the game. And, uh, I can't wait to have them on the show just to have a raw feedback from them. And I'll, I'd like to tell you guys about them before they come in so that you can look at them a little more objectively to see their mindset. And I think that's interesting. I love watching the development of people in general. The uh, that that's fun for me. Like I I cannot wait to get a new client. More so just to see how they develop with their body type and and their attitude going in. You know that that I have people that are very introverted and just don't 
have any explosion when they come to the gym. They mope in. They, they look like their cat just got murdered. And, you know, they come in and they just don't want to be there. And then they'll have a friend who's over the top extroverted and just always looking for the next new stimuli. And they're, they'll, they'll overshoot their friend. The, 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 the introverted guy will come in and actually be bigger and stronger, but then the extroverted guy will shoot past them with their numbers within four or five months of training just because the intensity is there. I always find that the most interesting thing, and you see it in people who are just starting out, you see it in professionals, you see it at advanced levels. There are people who need to you know, yell and scream and make a lot of noise that run up to a heavy squat. They're shaking the bar. They're, they're cursing the gods and, you know, kick a hole in the floor, and then they go and lift. And other people are just zen, just incredibly reserved, and they don't want to expend an ounce of energy that isn't invested in that lift. And but I think going back to, I mean, this is fun side barbell, and you were talking about how it's just fun. When you're making progress and you're helping people make progress, that's a lot of fun. And seeing it in your record books, which is, again, just a suggestion to keep really good records, uh, not even just numbers, but qualities, how things feel, you know, uh, little details about what equipment you're using, what kind of weights you're using, you know, what you're wearing. And, like, for a while, my squat max was 495. And, but it was something I could only do on a good day. On a bad day, it was much less. And so a year later, my max was still 495, but I had built confidence that I could roll out of bed, walk into the gym and do it um, on any given day. And I think that's a form of progression too. You know, you're not, you're not defined solely by your peaks and your valleys. You're defined by, you know, everything you're capable of doing, you know, and certain systems of training that are really married to percentages might give people problems there. And that's why a lot of people uh, like, like Jim Wendler will tell you shave uh, 10% off your, your best before you start calculating percentages because no one's going to base a percentage off their fourth or fifth best bench. Everyone wants to talk about their, their best bench you know, on the best day, but, you know, let's arbitrarily, let's say maybe 20% of your days are like that. 20% of them are absolute dog shit. And then the other 60 are just average. And, you know, are you going to live for those one out of five days where you feel great? You know, cause most people aren't professional weightlifters. Most people have jobs and responsibilities and things to worry about, you know, keeping things in their place how do you handle all those other stresses and still maintain, you know, that energy and those workouts? What's your diet like? What's your supplementation like? Do you treat your diet as supplementation? The uh, how much sleep are you getting? The um uh, about working a full time job. You could have two guys that both show up to a warehouse every day, work in that warehouse, moving boxes, picking up heavy stuff. And then both are friends. They're going to go to the gym afterwards. One is going to excel, and the other one is just going to be beat up. The, like, that happens. Like, we're not all built the same. We all have different needs. I need tremendous amounts of sleep in order to function. I, I never knew that because I don't like to sleep. I, I, I'll stay up two, three days straight with, with no issue. But I need sleep in order to recover to get get tight enough to bench. The, uh, the, my central nervous system shuts down immediately. The, uh, like, so let's, let's get into that training. Like the, you know, if you, if you're going to devote enough time to this sport and you have the means to then, and you want to try to be a pro level power lifter, I'm all for it. Go for it. If you want to do it as your afternoon hobby, your, your after work hobby, Longevity. Yeah, just, you know, go for it that way too. But put it into perspective. Um, a perfect example is we follow 
um, right now a, a mixture, a hybrid of of what West Side Barbell, what you see from West Side Barbell. Like obviously, it's not the same training as being at West Side Barbell. Um, anyone who knocks West Side Barbell uh, without being there, like for a, for a few years, I don't think is giving Louis Simmons and his West Side Barbell credit. Um, it's, it's an aggressive attitude. It's, it's very logical. Um, I mean, the, the, the gist is you, you, when there's breakdown in your form, what movements are going to help make you stronger where that breakdown occurs? Like that's the, the, the cliff notes version right there. And Louis has figured all that out. He has taken the Russian manuals. He's evolved with time. People will knock Louis for um, saying one thing and then seeing him do another. He's evolving with the times. He says that himself. He, you know, he is going to use whatever the greatest and latest technology is, what what science is showing to be the most optimal way of training, and and deploy that to the people under him at Westside. And Westside is just a different beast altogether. Um, you know, I've, I've had the luxury of visiting there. I am not a West Side barbell lifter. Um, I, I am in no class with those guys, but I have had the luxury of visiting. Uh, Louie probably wouldn't know me from a hole in the wall. Um, I've talked to him on the phone, uh, countless times and I feel like a girl at a Justin Bieber concert. <laughs> You're talking every, about being giddy. When, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like he, I was just calling there to see if, if they had a four XL t-shirt and he picked up the phone <laughs> and I, he talked to me for over 45 minutes and with that 45 minute conversation, uh, it took six weeks, but he actually got me through a plateau on my bench and we'll talk about that too. But Get, getting back to it, we do a hybrid of what Westside Barbell is and what Elite FTS is. Um, and again, it's neither one of those things. It's just a hybrid of what we enjoy doing. Uh, we're not competing right now. Um, some of the guys that work out with us will be. And so far, so good. Uh, it, it's not broken, so we haven't had to fix it. Uh, the beauty of it is, and again, we're trying to hit those new guys, so we're talking to the new guys that don't know what this stuff is. Go check out EliteFTS.com. Go check out WestSideBarbell.com. Like, read the articles. Just get an idea of what this sport is. Like, if you're taking just what we say and going with it, that you're, you're not doing yourself a service. And I think that's a great point for going back to the overall subject of if you go back again and change things, and giving advice to people starting off and developing is you want to you don't want to put absolute trust in one guy you saw on YouTube in one or even one researcher one style of training more i think it's trusting established systems trusting established training templates rather than cults of personality like there are systems that are used by some great lifters and pretty much only by those great lifters. But there's other systems that can be broadly applied. They can be scaled up or scaled down to, uh, to a beginner and take you where you need to be. And when you talk about this research and this evolving that has been done at Westside Barbell, as a beginner, you don't need to worry so much. You can read it. You can learn but you don't need to reinvent the wheel because people like that have, they've been working at this for decades, you know, and in good gyms, you can look around and know right away, there's some strong motherfuckers. And it's not necessarily true that the strongest guy is the most knowledgeable, but very often it can be people who have developed a great level of strength over the years. They might know something and I think there's always going to be a debate over practical first-hand experience versus academic learning because now in the fitness world, there are so many people with all sorts of letters after their names who really, they aren't making progress, not for themselves, not for their clients. They can go through all sorts of high-minded concepts with you. I'm saying this as a scientist, um, it doesn't apply much to training. You know, screen, screening through 
articles on PubMed is fun for, for some people, but it doesn't necessarily translate to better training. I think there's context involved, there's experience involved, and I think it's better to draw on other people's experience than to try to reinvent the wheel constantly. There's people who are completely green beginners saying, I wrote this program, um, what do you guys think of it? And they'll say, why? Why'd you bother? You know, you, you don't need to do this. You can, there's all sorts of programs oriented specifically towards beginners and focus on training hard, focus on progressing because there really isn't a perfect program. What's going to work for you in your first year is probably not going to work for you in your fifth year um, and longer. Things have to evolve and have to change. So, so here, here's, here's an example. Um, it's under a lot of different names, and literally everybody repackages studies, and then will name it something different. And if you do enough research, you'll find that. But um, back in the mid '90s, uh, I had a muscle magazine. It could have been any one of them: uh, Muscle and Fitness, Flex, I forget. And it talked about German volume training. And it was a huge, extensive article over three or four pages. And then to finish the article, you had to scroll through, uh, you know, five more pages of protein ads just to get to the last little paragraph. Was it the one where Lee Priest gained uh, 400 pounds of fat in the off season and then uh, got shred up? You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, every uh, every single month, there's the latest and greatest guy doing the latest and greatest thing. And nine times out of ten, it's just some editor writing about that guy. Like, you know, like how come every month I get to learn what Ronnie Coleman does for buys? And it's never the same. <laughs> the, like there's a lot of information out there. But the German volume training was very simple. It was find out your one rep max on like the bench press squat. Uh, they even had like leg press in there that, you know, it's, who cares? Um, and use 65% of that for 10 sets of 10. And the whole idea was is you rest for two minutes and then you do it again, exactly two minutes. And their concept was, okay, over the first few sets with this 65%, you're going to be fresh. You should be able to hit 10 reps. But as the sets go on around four or fifth set, you're going to start to fail. Because you, your fast twitch is uh, muscle fiber isn't going to be engaging as quickly, and you're going to start to lose reps, but you still rest the two minutes. And in the later sets, they're hyping about how your slow twitch fiber will engage more efficiently, so you might even gain reps. And by the end of it, you you pretty much shoot for ten sets of ten, but you're probably going to get ten, ten, eight, six, four, four, three, six, nine, whatever. And over time, you would keep it at that weight till you were able to successfully get 10 by 10 and then up the weight five pounds or decrease the rest period by 30 seconds. And OK, like, I mean, looking back at that now, it's like, OK, well, why is that variable five pounds? If 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 my bench is 100 pounds to start for for doing uh, for a hundred pound max, and I'm using 65 percent, which would be 65 pounds. Adding five pounds is a five percent increase in weight. That's a big deal. But if I'm a 400 pound bencher, five pounds is nothing. It's less than one percent. Like what, what? Where was the logic in that? It didn't make any sense. Now looking back at it, but you, you don't know anything. You come in, and I did that, and honestly, I got good results with it. But only in my triceps. My chest didn't grow. I have the world's smallest chest. And the uh, all I did was get super huge triceps and major injuries in my right shoulder, which is just from living on the ranch. The injuries accumulated. But my triceps got big. And then, and then it occurred to me only years later um, after seeing another person in the gym who – had a horrible bench compared to mine, but had a huge chest and his arms were a lot longer. And, and, a, and, a, and I realized that his, that the bar path was so much longer and based on his body ergonomics, his chest was involved in more in the bench press than mine was. 
So the volume training worked, but on different muscles. So, I mean, this guy had no triceps and a huge chest. I have no chest and huge triceps. We're all built differently. Um, you know, they, uh, there's a good friend of ours. Uh, we won't throw his name out yet. We'll ask him first. <laughs> but literally, we, we're discussing him nine times out of ten whenever we're talking about the, the quiet guy at the gym that only does the big lifts, and that's it. But yeah. he, he doesn't actually grow larger in his muscles and his legs, like when you look at him from month to month, but he's getting a lot stronger. He's ergonomically built to lift. If you, uh, your genetics actually suck if you, gr if you get huge muscles from doing the movements, uh, and I'm really going way out on a limb of sucking. They, um, like, <laughs> yeah, wow, this really sucks, man. I got huge. Yeah, like you, you actually <laughs> just, you're, you just biomechanically are awful. Your body has to now b destroy muscle tissue quicker than the next guy and have it build bigger so that you can accomplish the same task as somebody else who's doing the same work with smaller muscle mass. I think it, it goes back to the same, you know, people who who learn by training with the barbell, they do the same basic lifts. And but because everyone's built differently, those same stresses affect everyone in vastly different ways. Some people are if even like something as basic as a chin up, some people just do chin ups with their arms. And you'll see light guys with big arms who can just knock out chin ups. And this happens to all of us as we move past like the introduction to training and learning the basic lifts. Uh, over time, you start to learn how they affect you and how you bear them. And that really leads me into a, another point I really would like to emphasize for a beginner is learning to do exercises that you absolutely despise doing. Because for, for me, um, I enjoy squatting. I do, I do pretty well with it. But I was always of the mentality, well, if you kill squats and, you know, maybe toss in some leg extensions at the end of the day, hey, you can call that day because you worked really hard and squats are the king of all exercises, bro. But really, um, what I've learned in the past couple of years is that things like lunges, which I would always either avoid completely out of laziness, say, because, oh, yeah, because I killed squats so hard and I'm tired, or um, I would half-ass them because, after all, their lunges, you know, I got a good movement with them. And if I could go back, I would absolutely kick myself for doing that because it's those small muscles that are a little bit, they take a little more nuance to train. It can take more time, and they're easily exhausted. The small muscles around the hip, uh, building, building the core strength to go along with a big squat and a big deadlift, uh, that can take a lot of time, and it's a broken record, but really don't neglect those small, less notable muscle groups. And when a lot of people say that, they assume you're saying you're talking to people who bench and curl all day, and you're telling them to emphasize legs. But really, I think we can all listen to that by saying things like uh, face pulls, things like leg curls, even, even calf work, core work. Uh, especially lower back work, all of these things are going to become more and more important as you advance and get less and less out of those main barbell lifts. So for me, seeking out exercises that I absolutely hate doing is something that's going to, I know is going to make me better. Um, and it's something we'll have to confront at one point or another. The, and and it's funny because again, getting back to what I talked about earlier, where like you have to find little wins. I'll take a, a movement that we haven't done in a while, and by we is I always train in a group. Uh, the because uh, I'm either training clients or I'm training with friends, and you know uh, like I'm kind of the leader. Like there's no way around it. Like I you know the uh, we're going to do pretty much what I dictate for that workout and. I like to throw in one movement for every person in the group that they need, but that means everybody else has to do it too. Um, but I'll, I'll take a piece of equipment that we haven't touched in a while, and now we're going to just get better at that. And it's silly, but like the, the, the one gym that I'm at has an old-school hammer strength uh, shin machine, 
and I never saw a shin machine in my life. Shin machine. Say it with me. Shin machine. Shin machine. We're really digging into the concept of small, yeah. underemphasized muscles. And I never realized how weak my shin muscle is. And the uh, I have issues with uh, peripheral artery disease. So I have a lot of blown out veins in my legs, and my legs retain a lot of water weight. And uh, so I just started sitting on this shin machine, and... Uh, I started with a 10-pound plate on it, and pretty much all you're doing is picking up your toes and driving your heel down and returning. You could almost simulate it if you put your foot through a kettlebell and stood off of a step and just picked up your toes. You're probably doing it now listening, aren't you? And they, um, and they, uh, it's, it, was, it was unique. And, you know, over the course of time, it's like, you know what, I want to get really good at this. So I treated it just like powerlifting, <laughs> and I found my one rep max. And then, so I could gauge my progress. I want to know when I can beat that. And uh, so, you know, I went from being able to use a little 10-pound plate for 10 to 15 quality reps uh, to just over the course of a few months, building up to 50 pounds, moving up to 100 pounds for reps. And it was really neat. And the um, and I found, because uh, I'm 340 pounds, of filet mignon, that when I when I do lunges, my ankles are very weak. I have little baby feet and a huge teapot body. And when I take a step to do a lunge, I feel a lot of pressure in all directions through my metatarsals. Uh, and I found that just working this shin machine, I actually have a very, very sturdy base when I go to step now. And that was just one change in my workout, and I take that as a win. So, you know, the uh, there's always something that you can always get better at within the gym that will help the, your other lifts, and those other lifts will then help your primary lifts. Usually, hard work is going to find its way into some kind of improvement, but hard work and smart, targeted training, you're going to see those improvements where you need them to advance yourself towards your goals, whatever those may be. You know, if you're trying to fix the weak point in a lift. For me, a, another thing I struggled with was uh, I ran to a plateau in my bench and I wound up spending six months um, emphasizing overhead press. You know, I for a long time, I'd only done with dumbbells. I treated it as a lightweight exercise. And moving from sets of 10 to 15 with dumbbells to sets of 3 to 5 with a barbell completely change things uh, and what's good is when you have experience in lifting in general it's it's going to become harder and harder to find things that you're legitimately bad at and you you sort of start filling in holes in this overall metaphorical picture that is your strength and your body and usually they go hand in hand if someone's having problems with the bench, there might be a weak muscle group, and you might even be able to see it physically. In my case, it was shoulders. And when I started building up my shoulders from overhead press, um, not only could I notice it visually, but then when I went back to emphasizing bench, that plateau was gone, and I was able to, to make progress again. So, but the thing is, you can't cash in that card repeatedly. It doesn't you know, renew for lack of a better word, you have to keep finding what the next barrier is. And when it comes to targeting your weaknesses, which in um, conjugate style training is, is a huge part of that, um, it really goes back to finding what that need is and then doing the exercise for it. And odds are it's probably something that you're terrible at, at least at first. So, you know, with all that said, you know, what did we talk about tonight? Find out what your goal is. Read some stuff. Listen to everything that you can. Um, you know, you being so new into it, you you know, don't get locked into one methodology. Okay, find out what works for you. Easier said than done, because what works for you, you're not going to know for for a couple years. What would you say is a good time frame for someone starting out? Say. I'm going to try this program. How long should I stick with it before saying, you know, to give it an honest shot? You know what? I I don't think that there is a time frame. 
you got to believe in it. Mm -hmm. So research enough, spend a week or two. It's not going to change you going to the gym. No matter what, if you're into, into bench squatting and deadlifting, mm -hmm. you're already powerlifting. So keep going to the gym. You know, everyone is going to say to do, you know, singles, doubles, and triples. So do singles, doubles, and triples. You know, do, do have a one rep max day safely. Uh, you know, see where you're at. Find your max. Um, you know, see, like, you know, like, figure, find out where you're failing in your lift. I mean, technology is so great now. Everyone's blogging everything they do. See if you're failing at the bottom, at the mid-range, at the top. Where's your positioning? These are all things you're not going to know, but you're going to have that data ready. And you could send it to us. Yeah, and you would be shocked how many people, when they set up for a, for a heavy squat, their feet are not even in line with each other. Yeah. And um, there's all sorts of little things in your form that you can get away with with lighter weight, but as you start moving up, you really can't get away with that, and they sort of become hammered in, and you don't even realize you're doing them. So really, uh, videotaping is your best friend. And yeah, if we welcome anything like that to the email. Right. Fine. F you know, stick it out. Do some research. See what kind of program you you are thinking about going with. It's like if you were a kid and you had the option of like picking between going to Taekwondo, Karate, or Kung Fu, or Judo, or fencing. Like you know, which one appealed to you? Which one did you did you you know kick and scream to your parents to send you to? You know, did you have that option? You know the uh, like you know like they're, they're like you know because if you're behind it with your heart, then you're going to be behind it with your head, and your body will follow. So you know it, it it doesn't change with powerlifting. Like at the end of the day, you still have to find a one rep max. Are you going to do that one rep max every time you come in the gym? No. You're going to train to get a new one rep max. What method are you going to use? I don't think putting a time frame on that is fair. Which way feels the best for you? I didn't feel good going in and just doing the classical lifts. I did it for the first uh, three years of my real lifting in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, I didn't know any better. Um, I worked off of Western periodization, and I did um, – High percentages with with higher reps in the eight to ten rep range, slowly going down, uh, upping like five percent a workout and lowering the reps, and it honestly worked. But that's all I did, and it was already built in that I was going to get hurt. So you had to kind of govern it just right, so that by the time of a meet, you weren't going to get hurt. Now. I say it was built in because I didn't know any better. Uh, I'm from New York. It's not a real powerlifting state. Um, you know, if I grew up in the Midwest, uh, you know, it, it would, things might have been different. I didn't have that readily available knowledge. Um, I was more prone to bodybuilding style knowledge. I'm sure. I'm sure some uh, some listener from Albany is furiously pounding the keyboard, say, saying, "Hey, I, I had some good. I had some good." meets <laughs> and the you know and and you know maybe it was my my naivete at the time uh, maybe I didn't want to learn anymore I still don't want to learn about nutrition I can, <laughs> I can boring, tell it's boring as shit, I can frankly. tell you how to eat <laughs> I ain't gonna eat that way yep. the uh, but you know so so devote yourself to the method that you like I like the conjugate system because there really is no wrong way to do it because it's a variety you're picking movements that are helping the primary movements based on your needs. Um, we add extra work in to build up ultra weak parts because with our little fun group that we have, we're all at, at different stages of the game. So everybody gets to have like a strength while we're working out, which keeps it fun. I have one guy that is uh, 21 years old and he has no endurance. He has no hamstrings. He has no real physical prowess in the gym, but he wanted to deadlift so bad that within the course of less than a year of working with me, he went from like a 300 plus deadlift up to a 500 plus deadlift. Don't ask him to do anything else. <laughs> he will, and he'll turn purple and, and he'll do it, but he'll peter out and he'll, he'll beat himself up. 
and he's slowly getting bigger and stronger, but that deadlift was the most important thing because that's all he really wanted. So he lived and breathed deadlifting, but in order to live and breathe deadlifting, he had to build up his lower back and hamstrings, and his first few months was literally nothing but conditioning. He wouldn't. He never even got to deadlift. He was like, he's like, I'll give you more money. Like, like, let me deadlift. I wouldn't let him deadlift because he wasn't ready to deadlift. And we, you know, so we built it up first, doing everything else. And uh, I have another guy who, the uh, like, you know, I thought the bench was going to be his worst lift ever. He out of the box, he he was he was not very strong. He was very very slow. Uh, his bench was was in the high 100s, and but he came from a jujitsu background, and he knows how to listen. And it was actually really unique because I didn't realize how good of a listener he was. And sometimes I'll just run off at the mouth for 20 minutes, like I'm doing right now. And <laughs> but he would take it all in, and he would do it. And he was like the first client I had that actually did all the extra little crap. And he. You know, because like you'll you can go onto YouTube and just type in proper bench press setup, and you know a majority of them for powerlifting is going to be you know like grab the bar, pull it apart. You know what does that mean? Uh, you know, grab the bar, pull it apart. You know, push your feet through the ground underneath of you, lock out your legs. You know, use eighty percent leg drive and then a hundred percent leg drive on the way up, and and pull your shoulder blades together, drop them down. Uh, try to touch them to your ass, huge arc in your body. There's going to be all kinds of stuff out there. And he did all of it, though. Like, he did it all, and he had the flexibility to do it all. And it was just like – it was like such a treat. And then, like – go and, and he – his bench press started slowly climbing. And he was, like, literally hitting new numbers every max effort day. And, you know, now that it's getting a little harder – uh, for him, and he's not PRing all the time, which PR is personal record. Um, the more you know. The, uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> you know, now he's starting to see where there's breakdowns, like where he needs to work more. Because right off the bat, if any trainer wants to take credit for taking a brand new guy and bringing them to a new level in six months, they're, they're self limited. Yeah, they're 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 aggrandizing themselves. Is aggrandizing a word? Yeah. Good. Well, so, well, something you see a lot with with, with trainers is uh, is you know I'm gonna work with great great athletes. I'm gonna help guys train for the NFL Combine. I'm gonna you know uh, build up these great athletes. And the thing is, great athletes are are training them is very very different than what you see from other people. I mean, these people are coming in with already a base of strength and work capacity and like th there's notions out there about um and it it drives me nuts because the internet can be a, a great and terrible thing sometimes because you can publicly see the workouts that say like an nfl player does and say oh i'm shot hey deshaun jackson could only bench 225 for three reps at the combine. Hey, I can do that. Why can't I play in the NFL? It's because well, because you can't do all the other things that this guy can do, and he's not a bench presser, you know. And I think that you don't want to get too pigeonholed into one area um, as that being a definer of, of an athlete. And a trainer can teach anyone to, to do all sorts of things, especially a decent athlete. But is it going to help you get? to your goals is it going to carry you to where you need to be and I think that's why whether you're working with a trainer or training alone you really want to learn about different training styles you want to you want to entertain a lot of ideas but still stay true to what you're doing and commit to it and see a program through rather than hop from program to program talk to people talk to people at your gym who are accomplished and have goals that have achieved goals that you're after. There's knowledge out there. And I think the longer you spend doing this, you know, experience under the bar, experience learning about training, you sort of develop a context and bigger ideas start emerging. And that's you, the fun. And that's the fun. And you learn how to identify bullshit when you see it too. And it's less true in training 
that is for nutrition, which is just a sorry state of a field right now where a thousand different people are trying to promote a thousand different ideologies. And it seems that there's a new one cropping up every couple of months with conflicting data and misapplied data and everything being out of context. So approaching it as a kid at a candy store and saying, I want to learn this, I want to learn that, learning to avoid bullshit schemes that are pretty much only designed to separate you from your money is basically learning to avoid that candy van as a kid, which is another great life skill. Yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, like, you know, what, what's that old saying? The, 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 the uh, journey is just as, uh, is more fun than the, than the destination. Than the destination. The, oh, yeah, abso absolutely. Because at the end of the day, I mean, a, a powerlifter's career, for, you know, quote unquote career, um, but let's say you reach your goals and you, you want to bench 315. Okay, you go home at the end of the day, you take a shower, you wake up the next morning, then what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, is, is, do you just hang it up? Uh, I mean, I actually, I have a friend of mine whose only purpose in lifting was to bench 300. He eventually did it and completely stopped exercising altogether. But I, I have a feeling most people don't think that way. There's always something else to do. And I think that's something that um, applies to people as your training evolves as you get older. You know, you meet guys at the, at the gym who are, you know, in their in their 50s, but they look great. And they've had to confront that and say, yeah, you know, maybe maxing out every week isn't for me anymore, but I've learned other things I can do to uh, keep moving forwards. Like steroids. Another, <laughs> which would be another <laughs> excellent, excellent topic uh, for another day. Yeah. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Again, please send us uh, send us anything you got. Uh, you know, we'll take any question you got. There's no order to this. Do you love us? Do you hate us? Do you think you're we're okay? Uh, is there topics that you would like to hear us talk about? We'd be happy to help anyone with anything we're not really we're not selling anything here we don't we don't have a uh, fun side barbell brand protein powder or anything like that so really we're, we're just doing this to help help people out and hopefully have a lot of fun all right talk to you next time bye everyone